Act 3. The same. The following evening. A new lamp lighted is on the table. The wallpaper door is barricaded with a chair. From the room above comes the sound of pacing footsteps. The nurse stands listening, troubled. Enter Laura from within. Laura. Did he give you the keys? Nurse. Give? No, God help us. I took them from the coat Noid had out to brush. Then it's Noid who's on duty? Hi, it's Noid. Give me the keys. Here you are. But it's no better than stealing. Hark him up there, to and fro, to and fro. Are you sure the door is safely bolted? It's bolted safely enough. Weeps. Laura, opening the bureau and sitting down at it. Pull yourself together, Margaret. The only way we can protect ourselves is by keeping calm. A knock at the hall door. See who that is. Nurse, opening the door. It's Noid. Tell him to come in. Noid, entering. Dispatch from the colonel. Give it to me. Reads. I see. Noid, have you removed the cartridges from all the guns and pouches? Yes, ma'am, just as you said. Wait outside while I write the colonel. Exit Noid. Laura writes. Sound of sawing above. Listen, madam. Whatever is he doing now, do be quiet, I'm writing. Lord, have mercy on us. What will be the end of all this? Laura, holding out the note. Here you are. Give it to Noid. And remember, my mother's to know nothing of this. Exit nurse with note. Laura opens the bureau drawers and takes out papers. Enter pastor. My dear Laura, as you probably gathered, I have been out all day and only just got back. I hear you've been having a terrible time. Yes, brother. I've never been through such a night and day in all my life. Well, I see you're looking none the worse for it. No, thank heaven. I wasn't hurt. But just think what might have happened. Tell me about it. I've only heard rumors. How did it begin? It began by him raving about not being Bertha's father, and ended by him throwing the lighted lamp in my face. But that is appalling. He must be quite out of his mind. What in heaven's name are we to do? We must try to prevent further violence. The doctor is sent to the hospital for a straight jacket. I have just written a note to the colonel, and now I am trying to get some idea of the state of our affairs, which Adolf has so shockingly mismanaged. Opens another drawer. It's a miserable business altogether. But I always feared something of the kind might happen. When fire and water meet, there's bound to be an explosion. Looks in drawer. Whatever's all this? Look. This is where he's kept everything hidden. Good heavens. Here's your old doll. And there's your christening cap. And Bertha's rattle and your, your letters and that locket. Wipes his eyes. He must have loved you very dearly, Laura. I never kept this kind of thing. I believe he did love me once. But time changes everything. What's this imposing document? Examines it. The purchase of a grave? <laughs> a better grave than the asylum. Laura, be frank with me. Aren't you at all to blame? How can I be to blame because someone goes out of his mind? Well, I'll say no more. After all, blood's thicker than water. Meaning what, if I may ask? Pastor, gazing at her. Oh, come now. What? Come, come. You can scarcely deny that it would suit you down to the ground to have complete control of your daughter. I don't understand. Can't help admiring you. And as for me, 
I shall be appointed guardian to that freethinker whom, as you know, I have always regarded as a terror among our wheat. Laura gives a quick laugh which she suppresses. How dare you say that to me? His wife. How strong-willed you are, Laura. How amazingly strong-willed. Like a fox in a trap that would gnaw off its own leg rather than be caught. Like a master thief working alone without even a conscience for accomplice. Look in the mirror. You daren't. I never use a mirror. No. You daren't look at yourself. Let me see your hand. Not one telltale spot of blood. Not a trace of that subtle poison. A little innocent murder that the law cannot touch. An unconscious crime. Unconscious? A stroke of genius, that. Listen to him up there. Take care, Laura. If that man gets loose, he will saw you in pieces, too. You must have a bad conscience to talk like that. Pin the guilt on me if you can. I can't. You see? You can't. And so, I am innocent. And now you look after your charge and I'll take care of mine. Enter doctor. Ah, here's the doctor. Rises. I'm so glad to see you, doctor. I know I can count on you to help me, although... I'm afraid not much can be done now. You hear him up there? Are you convinced at last? I am convinced that there has been an act of violence. But the question is, should that act of violence be regarded as an outbreak of temper or insanity? Pastor, but apart from this actual outbreak, you must admit he suffers from fixed ideas. I have a notion, Pastor, that your ideas are even more fixed. My firmly rooted convictions of spiritual convictions apart, it rests with you, Madam, to decide if your husband is to be fined or imprisoned or sent to the asylum. How do you regard his conduct? I can't answer that now. Oh? Have you no uh, firmly rooted convictions of what would be best for the family? And you, Pastor? There's bound to be a scandal either way. It's not easy to give an opinion. But if he were only fined for violence, he could be violent again. And if he were sent to prison, he would soon be out again. So it seems best for all parties that he should be treated as insane. Where is the nurse? Why? She must put the straitjacket on the patient. Not at once, but after I've had a talk with him and not then until I give the order. I have the, uh, garment outside. Goes out to hall and returns with a large parcel. Kindly call the nurse. Laura rings. The doctor begins to unpack the straitjacket. Dreadful. Dreadful. Enter nurse. Doctor. Ah, nurse. Now, please pay attention. You see this jacket? When I give you the word, I want you to slip it on the captain from behind, so as to prevent any further violence, you understand. Now it has, you see, unusually long sleeves. That is to restrict his movements. These sleeves must be tied together behind his back. And now, here are two straps with buckles, which afterwards you must fasten to the arms of a chair, or whatever's easiest. Can you do this, do you think? No, doctor. I can't. No, not that. Laura. Why not do it yourself, doctor? Because the patient distrusts me. You, madam, are the proper person. But I'm afraid he doesn't trust you either. Laura grimaces. Perhaps you, pastor. I must beg to decline. Enter Noid. Laura. Did you deliver my note? Yes, madam. Doctor. Oh, it's you, Noid. You know the state of things here, don't you? You know the captain has had a mental breakdown. You must help us look after the patient. 
If there's all I can do for the captain, he knows I'll do it. You are to put this jacket on him. Nurse, he's not to touch him. Noid shan't hurt him. I'd rather do it myself. Gently. Gently. But Noid can wait outside and help me if need be. Yes, that's what he best do. A pounding on the paper-covered door. Doctor. Here he is. To nurse. Put the jacket on that chair under your shawl. And now go away, all of you, while the pastor and I talk to him. That door won't hold long. Hurry. Nurse, going out. Lord Jesus, help us all. Laura shuts the bureau and follows the nurse. Noid goes out to the hall. The paper-covered door bursts open, the lock broken, and the chair hurled to the floor. The captain comes out, carrying a pile of books. Captain, putting the books on the table. Here it all is. You can read it in every one of these volumes. So I wasn't mad after all. Picks one up. Here it is in the Odyssey. Book 1, page 6, line 215 in the Upsala translation. Telemachus speaking to Athena. My mother says I am Odysseus's son. Before myself I cannot tell. It's a wise child that knows its own father. And that's the suspicion Telemachus has about Penelope, the most virtuous woman. <laughs> Fine state of affairs, eh? Takes up another book. And here we have the prophet Ezekiel. The fool saith lo, here is my father. But who can tell whose loins who have engendered him? That's clear enough. Picks up another. And what's this? A history of Russian literature by Merzlikov. Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest poet, was mortally wounded but more by the rumors of his wife's unfaithfulness than by the bullet he received in his breast at the duel. On his deathbed he swore she was innocent. Jackass! How could he swear any such thing? I do read my books, see? Hello, Jonas. Are you here? And the doctor, of course. Did I ever tell you what I said to the English lady who was deploring the habit Irishmen of having throwing lighted lamps at their wives' faces? God, what woman, I said. Women, she stammered. Of course, I replied. When things get to such a pass that a man who is loved has worshipped a woman picks up a lighted lamp and flings it in her face, then you may be sure. Pastor. Sure, sure of what? Captain. Nothing. You can never be sure of anything. You can only believe. That's right, isn't it, Jonas? One believes and so one is saved. <laughs> saved indeed. No. One can be damned through believing. That's what I've learned. Doctor. But Captain, hold your tongue! I don't want any chat from you. I don't want to hear you relaying all the gossip from in there like a telephone. In there, you know what I mean. Listen to me, Jonas. Do you imagine you're the father of your children? I seem to remember you had a tutor in the house, a pretty boy about whom there was quite a bit of gossip. Take care, Adolf. Feel under your wig and see if you don't find two little knobs. Upon my soul, he's turning pale. Well, well. It was only talk, of course, but... My God, how they talked. But we married men are all figures of fun. Every man jack of us. Isn't that right, Doctor? What about your own marriage bed? Didn't you have a certain lieutenant in your house, sir? Wait now, let me guess. He was called... Whispers in the doctor's ear. By Jove, he's turned pale too. But don't worry. She's dead and buried. So what was done can't be done again. As a matter of fact, I knew him. And he's now... Look at me, doctor. No. Straight in the eyes. He is now a major at Dragoons. Good lord, I believe he has horns too, doctor, angrily. Be so good as to change the subject, captain. <laughs> See, as soon as I mention horns, he wants to change the subject. Pastor, I suppose you know, brother-in-law, that you're not in your right mind. Yes, I do know. But if I had the handling of your decorated heads, I should soon have you shut up too. I am mad. But how did I become mad? Doesn't that interest you? No. It doesn't interest anyone. 
takes the photograph album from the table. Christ Jesus, there's my daughter. Mine. That's what we can never know. Should I tell you what we should have to do is to know? First, marry. In order to be accepted by society, then immediately divorce. After that, become lovers, and finally, adopt the children. That way one could at least be sure they were one's own adopted children, eh? But what good's that to me? What good's anything now that you have robbed me of my immortality? What can science or philosophy do for me when I have nothing left to live for? How can I live without honor? I grafted my right arm and half my brain and spinal cord onto another stem. I believe they would unite and grow into a single, more perfect tree. Then someone brought a knife and cut below the graft. So now I'm only half a tree. The other part with my arm and half my brain goes on growing. But I wither. I am dying. I am dying, for it is the best part of myself I gave away. Let me die. Do what you like with me. I'm finished. The doctor and pastor whisper, then go out. The captain sinks into a chair by the table. Bertha enters. Bertha, going to him. Are you ill, father? Captain, looking up stupidly at the word father. Me? Do you know what you did? You threw a lamp at Mother. Did I? Yes. Supposing she'd been hurt. Would that have mattered? You're not my father if you talk like that. What'd you say? Not your father? How'd you know? Who told you? Who was your father then? Who? Not you, anyway. Anyone but me. Who then? Who? You seem well informed. Who told you? that I should live to hear my own child tell me to my face I am not her father. Do you realize you're insulting your mother by saying this? Don't you understand that if it's true, she is disgraced? You're not to say anything against mother, I tell you. Yes. All in league against me, just as you've always been. Father! Don't call me that again. Father. Father! Captain, drawing her to him. Bertha, my beloved child. Yes, you... You are... My child. Yes, yes, it must be so. It, It is so. All that was only a sick fantasy. It came on the wind like an infection or a fever. Look at me. Let me see my soul in your eyes. But I see her soul as well. You have two souls. You love me with one and hate me with the other. You must love me and only me. You must have only one soul or you have no peace. Neither shall I. You must have only one mind, fruit of my mind. You must have only one will. Mine. No. No, I want to be myself. Never. I am a cannibal, you see, and I'm going to eat you. Your mother wanted to eat me, but she didn't succeed. I am Saturn who devoured his children because it was foretold that otherwise they would devour him. To eat or to be eaten, that is the question. If I don't eat you, you will eat me. You've shown your teeth already. Goes to the rack. Don't be afraid, my darling child. I shan't hurt you. Takes down a revolver. Bertha, dodging away from him. Help! Mother, help! He wants to kill me! Nurse, hurrying in. What in heaven's name are you doing, Mr. Adolf? Captain, examining the revolver. Did you remove the cartridges? Well, I did just tidy them away, But sit here and take it easy and I'll soon fetch them back. She takes the captain by the arm and leads him to a chair. He slumps down. She picks up the straight jacket and goes behind the chair. Bertha creeps out. Mr. Adolf, do you remember when you were my dear little boy? And I used to tuck you up at night and say your prayers with you? And do you remember how I used to get up in the night and give you a drink when you were thirsty? And how when you had bad dreams and couldn't go to sleep, I'd light the candle and tell you pretty stories. Do you remember? Go on talking, Margaret. It soothes my mind. Go on talking. Aye. 
that I will. But you listen carefully. Do you remember how once you took a great big kitchen knife to carve a boat with? And I came in and had to trick the knife away from you? You were such a silly little lad. One had to trick you. You never would believe what anyone did was for your own good. Give me that snake, I said, or else he'll bite you. And then see you let go of the knife. Takes the revolver from his hand. And then, too, when it was time for you to dress yourself and you wouldn't, I had to coax you and say you should have had a golden coat and be dressed like the prince. Then I took your little tunic, which was made just of green wool, and held it up in front of you and said, In with your arms now, both together. Gets the jacket on. And then I said, Sit nice and still now, while I button it up behind. Ties the sleeves behind him. And then I said, Up with you. Walk across the floor like a good boy. So nurse can see how it fits. Leads him to the sofa. And then I said, Now you must go to bed. What's that? Go to bed when i just been dressed? My God. What have you done to me? Tries to get free. Oh, you... Oh, you fiendish woman, what a devilish cunning. Who would have thought you had the brains for it? Lies down on the sofa. Pound, fleeced, outwitted, and unable to die. Forgive me, Mr. Adolf, forgive me. I had to stop you from killing the child. Why didn't you let me kill her? If life's hell and death's heaven and children belong to heaven, what do you know of the hereafter? It's the only thing one does know. Of life, one knows nothing. Oh, if one had known from the beginning. Humble your stubborn heart, Mr. Adolf. And cry to God for mercy. Even now it's not too late. It wasn't too late for the thief on the cross, and our Saviour said, Today thou shalt be in paradise. Croaking for a corpse already, old crow. She takes her hymn book from her pocket. He calls. Noid! Are you there, Noid? Enter Noid. Throw this woman out the house, or she'll choke me to death with her hymn book. Throw her out of the window. Stuff her up the chimney. Do what you like, only get rid of her. Noid, staring at the nurse. God save you, Captain. And that's from the bottom of my heart. But I can't do that. I just can't. If it were six men now, but a woman. What? You can't manage one woman. I can manage her, all right. But there's something that stops a man laying hands on a woman. What is this something? Haven't they laid hands on me? Yes, but... I just can't do it, sir. Same as if you was to tell me to hit the pastor. It's like religion. It's in your bones. I can't do it. Enter Laura. She signs to Noid, who goes out. Omphale, omphale. Playing with a club while Hercules spins your wool. Laura, approaching the sofa. Adolf, look at me. Do you believe I am your enemy? Yes, I do. I believe all you women are my enemies. My mother did not want me to come into the world because my birth would give her pain. She was my enemy. She robbed my embryo of nourishment, so I was born incomplete. My sister was my enemy when she made me knuckle under to her. The first woman I took in my arms was my enemy. She gave me ten years of sickness in return for the love I gave her. When my daughter had to choose between you and me, she became my enemy. And you, you my wife, have been my mortal enemy, for you have not let go of your hold until there is no life left in me. But I didn't mean this to happen. I never really thought it out. I may have had some vague desire to get rid of you. You were in my way. And perhaps, if you see some plans in my actions, there was one. But I wasn't conscious of it. I've never given a thought to my actions. They simply ran along the rails you laid down. My conscience is clear. And before God, I feel innocent, even if I'm not. You weighed me down like a stone, pressing and pressing till my heart tried to shake off its intolerable burden. That's how it's been. And if without meaning to, I have brought you to this. I ask for your forgiveness. Very plausible. But how does that help me? And whose fault is it? Perhaps our cerebral marriage is to blame. In the old days, one married a wife. 
Now one goes into partnership with a businesswoman who sets up house with a friend. Then one rapes the partner or violates the friend. What becomes of love, the healthy love of the senses? It dies of neglect. And what happens to the dividends from those love shares payable to holder when there's no joint account? Who was the holder when the crash comes? Who was the bodily father of the cerebral child? Suspicions about our daughter are entirely unfounded. That's the horror of it. If they had some foundation, they would at least be something to catch hold of, to cling to. Now there are only shadows lurking in the undergrowth, peering out the grinning faces. It's like fighting with air. A mock battle with blank cartridges. Reality, however deadly, puts one to one's metal, nerves, body, and soul for action. But as it is... As it is, my thoughts dissolve in fog. My brain grinds a void till it catches fire. Put a pillow under my head. Lay something over me. I'm... I'm cold. I'm... I'm terribly cold. Laura takes off her shawl and spreads it over him. Exit, nurse. Give me your hand, my dear. (laughs) My hand. Which you have bound behind my back. Um, Umphale, (laughs) umphale. But I can feel your shawl soft against my mouth. It's warm and gentle like your arms and smells vanilla like your hair when you were young. When you were young, Laura, and we used to walk in the birch woods. There were primroses and thrushes. Lovely. Lovely. Think of how beautiful life was then. (laughs) And what it has become. You did not want it to become like this. Neither did I. Yet it has. Who then rules over our lives? God. The god of strife, then. Or nowadays, the goddess. Enter nurse with a pillow. Take away this cat that's lying to me. Take it away. Nurse removes the shawl and puts the pillow under his head. Bring my uniform. Put my tunic over me. The nurse takes the tunic from a peg and spreads it over him. To Laura. Oh, my tough lion skin that you would take from me. Omphale, omphale, you cunning woman. Lover of peace and contriver of disarmament. Wake, Hercules, before they take away your club. You would trick us out of our armor, calling it tinsel. It was iron, I tell you, before it came tinsel. In the old days, the smith forged the soldier's coat. Now it is made by the needlewoman. Omphale, omphale. Rude strength has fallen before treacherous wickedness. Shame on you, woman of Satan, and a curse on all your sex. He raises himself to spit at her, but sinks back down. What sort of pillow have you given me, Margaret? How hard and cold it is. So cold. Come and sit beside me on this chair. She does so. Yes, like that. Let me put my head on your lap. Ah, that's much warmer. Lean over me so I can feel your breast. Oh, how sweet it is to sleep upon a woman's breast. Be she mother or mistress. But sweetest of all the mothers. Laura. Adolf, tell me, do you want to see your child? My child? A man has no children. Only women have children. (laughs) 
so the future is theirs, while we die childless. <sighs> oh God, who holds all children dear? Nurse, listen, he's praying to God. No, to you, to put me to sleep. I'm tired, so tired. Good night, Margaret. <laughs> Blessed art thou among women. He raises himself, then with a cry falls back on the nurse's knees. Laura, at the door, calling. Doctor! Enter doctor and pastor. Help him, doctor. If it's not too late, look, he has stopped breathing. Doctor, feeling his pulse. It's a stroke. Pastor, is he dead? No. He might still wake, but but to what who can say? Pastor wants to die, but after this the judgment. No judgment, and no recriminations. You who believe that a god rules over human destiny must lay this to his charge. Ah, Pastor, with his last breath he prayed to God. Pastor, to Laura. Is this true? It is true. Doctor. If this be so, of which I am a poor judge as the cause of his illness. In any case, my skill is at an end. Try yours now, Pastor. Laura. Is that all you have to say at this deathbed, Doctor? That is all. I know no more. Let him who knows more speak. Bertha comes in and runs to Laura. Mother! Mother! My dear child. My own child. Amen. Curtain. And that is The Father. A tragedy in three acts written in 1887. If you like what I do, you can follow me on more social media platforms. I'm up on Spotify. I'm up on Facebook. I'm up on TikTok now, as I've said before. Um, whether or not it's any good is a completely different matter. But I'm also currently on uh, Patreon as well, if you would like to help out with that. I don't particularly feel like making a long outro for this particular episode, so I just want to say I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. Thank you.